Okay. 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 Um, welcome to the uh, Town of Amherst Council on Aging meeting um, today um, and pursuant to Governor Baker's uh, March 12, 2020 order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, uh, GLC 30A sec subsection 18. This meeting of the Council on Aging is being conducted via remote participation. Um, so I am going to do a roll call check right now. Um, and um, I'll, I will call you by your last, last name. And you, you just, this is a great opportunity for you to check to see if your, your video or audio is working properly. Just to remind you to, um, to unmute when you want to speak, when you want to uh, say that you are present. Okay, Greg Bascom. Uh, Dir uh, Dirks. Present. Okay, Koffler. Uh, Neil. Here. Pallison. I can tell you that Yvette is here. I've asked her yes, to. I'm here. Oh, there we are. Okay. Thank you. Excellent. Okay. Rector is here. Smith Crooks. I'm here. Mila Montemayor. I'm here. And Chad Fuller. Yep. Okay, great. All right, thanks everyone. Okay, uh, just um, again, um, just remember to mute or unmute. Um, sometimes I will, if I can't hear you or Mary Beth can't hear you, uh, we may just touch our ear to let you know if that uh, you need to un unmute uh, so we can hear your voices. You can also raise your hand if you are comfortable with that as an option. Um, Sharon Raynan is raising her hand. All right. Oh, I Go just ahead. want to introduce myself. That's all. Oh, wonderful. Oh, Karen, thank you. You're here. Lovely. Thank and you. Welcome. Yes, we do have some guests with us, Karen. Rannan? Uh, Rannan. Yeah, Rannan. Rannan. And um, also joining us is uh, Liz Welsh. Thank you. Did it? Yes, great. Okay. Um, any other guest? Yes, we have Richard Yurga with us. Yes, Richard, thank you. Yes. Yeah. So Karen Rainin is the okay. Senior Health Services Nurse and Liz Welsh is a representative from Amherst Neighbors. She was formerly the president and now she has another role. And Richard Yurga represents the Friends of the Amherst Senior Center, just for people who might be viewing this. And at around 920, we'll have another guest joining us. Mm -hmm. um, and um, um, Emma Dragon from the Department of Health. Oh, great. Okay, so uh, let's see here. Um, let me make sure. Um, so um, I call this meeting to order and I invite anyone in the public is now uh, welcome to make a comment or express their views up to three minutes. If you wish to speak, use the raise hand icon on the lower part of your screen or dial star nine if you are on the phone. And I, Liz Welsh has her hand raised. I don't know if there's anything that she wants to address at this time. I just wanted to do a quick little um, message and invitation that we have a couple of events coming up that you all may be interested in. Two that go together very nicely. Uh, one is creating your age in place plan that is being led by someone named Janet Bunce. And that will be very informative um, and helpful, I think. And it goes, it's coupled nicely with one um, a couple weeks later called Making Yours an, an Age-Friendly Home. So just things that you can do, both of those are kind of anticipatory. Janet works a lot with people who come to her in the midst of a, a bump in the road. And so part of hers and part of the second one um, is to help people anticipate um, before a crisis. And then the other event I just want to give a nice little plug to is political in nature, which some of our events are. And it is titled Challenges to Democracy and the Rule of Law um, that's being led by Austin Serrett, who teaches at Amherst College. So that is also extremely timely. 
anyway, just check out our, if you can always get in touch with any one of us, or you can go to amherstneighbors.org. And if you know people who are interested, anybody is welcome. If anybody needs help signing up, we also can help you with that process. That's Thank you. Excellent. Thanks so much, Liz, for sharing that uh, with us. So, okay. So um, as a launch pad for our meeting, uh, Mary Beth is going to uh, uh, boot up a, a song. Nice. Okay. Just give me a moment. Share screen. Okay. I'm hoping you are all seeing this. Yes? I am. Yeah. Okay. Pat, this is it, right? You bet. You bet. This is, this is a request of the chair. So uh, mm -hmm. I just want to make sure I do this right. In combination with my artistic uh, uh, in, um, inspiration, Mila Montemayor. Oh, I just wanted to get away from singing myself. <laughs> <laughs> Keep on moving forward. Keep on moving forward. Never turning back. Never turning back. Sigamos adelante. Siempre adelante. Siempre adelante, sin volver atrás, sin volver atrás. Gonna keep on loving boldly, keep on loving boldly, keep on loving boldly. with us Mindy Dom so I just want to I'm gonna uh, just jump her into the group here wonderful and Mindy I'm gonna ask you to unmute just to say hi and uh, have a moment <clears throat> okay so I guess I don't know I've asked there we go Mindy, do you want to check in and just say hi, introduce yourself? Looks like no, so just letting <laughs> y'all know. Okay. Okay. Well, well, welcome, uh, Mindy. We're so glad uh, that you're joining us and that you're you're alive and well. <laughs> so, okay. So uh, we're just going. We have a full agenda, and uh, we'll we'll keep marching through it as we. We go, um, and um, so uh, first uh, first item is uh, um, is updates and looking ahead from Mary Beth. Um, is um, you want to say 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 a few things, critical things? Sure. Yeah. Um, I guess I, uh, well a couple of things. I just as a matter of um, sort of bookkeeping with all of you, I hope you have received an email via Pat on the conflict of interest law and both a certificate you have to complete by February 5th 
uh, indicating that you've received some printed materials about conflict of interest, and also that there is an online training that you have to perform, and that has to be completed by April 5th. So I just wanted to make sure, and if anybody did not receive that, please just check in with me offline via email and I'll make sure that you get that information because uh, it's just critical to our work. Um, uh, we will at 9.20, so I'm, I'm sort of stalling if you're sensing that. Uh, in the next four minutes, um, Emma Dragon will be joining us uh, as our health director to give us some information around vaccines and, and what's mm -hmm. happening. I will tell you that the primary issue that's really concerning seniors in, in great, great number uh, is the rollout of vaccines to seniors. Presently, I'm sure many of you are aware, we are running a first responders vaccine clinic this past week here at the Bang Center. It's gone tremendously well. Um, and I can, I can just report, and I think the council would want to know that I literally receive hundreds of phone calls daily from seniors all day long. All the lines are ringing asking, can I book my um, appointment for a vaccine right now? People are extremely anxious about it, around what is the information and the timing of it. Um, and so I'm gonna just leave the details of that um, to um, Emma to sort of fill in around when that we can expect that that would be coming. But it is the, the lead concern uh, and a very, very grave concern um, for seniors across the board in our community. I, I just, we've never experienced the volume of calls that we're getting right now. Um, so mm -hmm. I, I just would want you to have that awareness um, for you. I do have mm -hmm. really great news. Another um, high profile service that we perform is that we partner with AARP for the tax service. And it has gone back and forth, as you know, over the past few months, um, whether they would be, whether AARP was going to perform it, whether there would be adequate volunteers in our Amherst area, because many, of course, as you understand, are older adults who perform this service as volunteers and they have uh, in, in some measure chosen to um, make sure that they were safe and have declined to participate. But um, I am happy to say that we are going to be partnering with the Hadley Senior Center. So Haley Wood there is the director and we are going to be rolling out a program where the taxes will be performed at the Hadley Senior Center curbside so what we anticipate and what we are working with AARP to create is a system by which we will have one day a week for Amherst residents. Um, so it will be a much smaller number than when we hosted them here and we had multiple days, though we will not be able to serve the broad number that we did formerly, uh, but it's the best that we can do during the pandemic. And the tax volunteers will be working inside the Hadley Senior Center um, distanced and spaced and separated in different rooms. Individuals who will be signing mm -hmm. up for an appointment, you would drive to the Hadley Senior Center at 8.30 in the morning. You will drop your packet of information off at 8.30 in the morning. They will then take it inside and the tax volunteers will work on it. And then you must pick it up at one o'clock the same day. So people also must be available by phone all day long during their appointment from 8.30 to 1, so that if an individual has any questions, um, that they would be able to, I realize I, I realize I have taken myself off video, sorry folks. <laughs> um, if somebody has questions, and they often do about, you know, a, a detail um, that you are available. So that's what we will be doing. We'll be working our day, it looks to be, will be Fridays, and it will not be starting till at least mid-February. So. AARP has pushed back the time frame several times due to the spread of COVID. Um, initially, we were looking at February 1st, but well, actually uh, January, then it went to February 1st. Now it has to be some date after February 15th. So um, that's what I am anticipating. We will be sending out the materials. I don't have all of the information yet from our volunteer team around the packets and that, but what I anticipate is probably announcing that February 1 is the likely date that we'll begin to accept phone appointments for Amherst uh, residents to do it. Um, so we can look forward to that opportunity because that that's a, I have to say, that's probably my number two um, issue for individuals um, because they're always nervous about filing their taxes on time. And just with regard to our operation, I'm just bringing to your attention that we have in the town buildings, we have depopulated. 
Um, and here's Emma Dragon. So I'm going to um, turn it over to her because she is live coming to us. Uh, she ran up from the vaccine clinic and so her time is really uh, precious. And I just wanna give her the opportunity uh, to give us the update. Thank you. Hello, everybody. I'm so happy to be here. Thank you for including me in your meeting. I know I'm really excited um, for the things to come. Um, we are, yes, we're having our first responder clinic uh, downstairs, which the I think the continual rollout of the vaccine can be cumbersome and complicated, and there's all these phases and steps, and where do I fit in? And I think all of us are having those questions. Um, and I know that even yesterday afternoon, um, they had an update for it as well, uh, even further to go through the intricacies of when can people get the vaccine. Um, so right now we are in phase one, step three of the rollout, which is the first responders. And there's six steps in phase one. And then we move to phase two, which is 75 and older, people with two plus co comorbidities, meaning if you have high blood pressure or diabetes, um, and then people who also live in public and private low income and affordable housing, as well as those great school teachers and adults over 65. What I do know is that yesterday, the state did include people, um, senior housing settings that are 75 and older at the end of phase one distribution. So not right now, even though I know we're all excited to jump in line and get it as soon as we can, but not quite yet. And as soon as that phase comes up, we will certainly get the word out there. I know Mary Beth is great about communication with all of her team and all of her great community um, stakeholders, all of you guys, and um, some more to come with that. Uh, here at the health department, we have been working so hard preparing for this moment. Um, I just started here in November 2nd. So Mary Beth, I, I know for me, it feels already like I've been here for a couple of years with all of the great stuff we've done. <laughs> Um, but really trying to lean forward, prepare for this vaccine rollout and, and us as a local health department, many local health departments and boards of health don't have the capacity and opportunity to be able to do this for at the local level with vaccine clinics. Uh, we are very unique in the way that Julie Fetterman, my predecessor, was able to get this department set up. Um, and Jennifer Brown, the public health nurse, I, I don't know where I would be without her. Um, she is my two hands on the wheel compass. Um, and, you know, we are really a team. Uh, Nancy Schroeder, our administration our assistant is fantastic um, and brings such a great institutional knowledge with her in terms of the town. And I'm just really excited to be here and all the great things that we're gonna do right now during our COVID response, but even beyond that, um, once this is all over, I, I know that there's great things that we can do. So I can take some questions if people wanted, had some questions, I could talk forever, but you don't wanna hear me blabber, blabber all day long. <laughs> I have one question and yeah. that is, uh, this is Pat Rector and hello and welcome um, Emma. Um, I, I guess the core question is this, what is the best single source of information on the vaccine? Because I know it's a changing landscape Yeah. and we check different sites every day, but can you recommend to us the best uh, single source of information on where to get, how and when to get the vaccine? Absolutely, Pat. So that would be through the mass.gov website with when can I get my COVID vaccine on that link, they are updating it at a minimum every Tuesday and Thursday. But I think they've been updating it every day. Um, and they have these great timelines. Let me see if I can, I have a million things open on my screen, but let's see if I can share my screen for a moment. 
Can everybody see it? Yes. Yeah. Oh, you're, so, you're so nimble. Okay. So I know. Well, thank you for that. My, my kids don't think I'm nimble, but you know, I'll take the compliment. So <laughs> this is a great visual that the state just came out with. I believe they just posted it yesterday to help us all have a sense in terms of where are we with the rollout in Massachusetts. And here mm -hmm. we can see that we are here in week two of January and that COVID facing healthcare workers, our long-term healthcare workers, uh, we've just started our first responders and as well as our congregate care settings, meaning our shelters and our corrections facilities. Um, so, and still in phase one rollout, we have those home-based healthcare workers to come in about two weeks, if not sooner, and then um, non-COVID facing healthcare workers, meaning healthcare workers that are not knowingly taking care of sick, infectious patients with COVID. Um, like if you were to go to the dermatology office or another specialist that you might see. Mm -hmm. um, and then they're starting to have all of these different tiles with lots of information for those specific um, groups. So mm -hmm. that's coming out as well. So wow. really this mass.gov website up here, where if you just were to type into Google, Massachusetts, when can I get my COVID vaccine and click on it, this, this is where it would come up to. So it's a great <laughs> thing. And, you know, even myself, I use this as a re reference for when we get calls um, and questions about for people asking when they're gonna get the vaccine because it changes so quickly. So even I use it as a reference. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, I have, <clears throat> excuse me, this is uh, Tim Neal. What is the status of the supply in the state? Do we have any issues with that? Just so yeah, I, I think um, we are at the, I don't want to say mercy, uh, but we, we, we are producing the vaccine, right? It's up to the companies, Moderna and Pfizer right now. Um, certainly Moderna is based out of Massachusetts, which I think is in our favor, but we are not just um, competing for ourselves in Massachusetts. It's throughout the United States and around the world for mm -hmm. people that are trying to get the vaccine. Um, I know, and, and it's coming out in what I would call batches, meaning groups of it, not all kind of being seamlessly going out at the same time consistently. So I, I think that right now, the amount of vaccine is, we're reaching the end of that, the one batch, meaning that I know that Bay State ran out of vaccine for their healthcare workers on Monday, but they were expecting a new shipment yesterday. So I think we are starting to reach a, a part of the story, if you will, where uh, it might be kind of on and off with vaccine distribution. I see two other hands. I see uh, Rosemary and Karen. So Rosemary, go ahead. Well, Emma answered my question about which type of vaccine and I wonder, is AstraZeneca coming through at all, or are we just using Moderna and Pfizer? Yeah, so I think as AstraZeneca comes along, they're going to be uh, weaved in here. Um, but right now, we have the Moderna vaccine on the community level. Um, and really, that Pfizer vaccine, because of the ultra-low storage requirements, are being held in the hospital-based systems. Thank you. And Karen? Um, just to one of the two things, Emma, I just wanted to say thank you for all that you've been doing already since you came. You're probably <laughs> pedaling so fast. Um, so thank you so much. Um, and so I was just a little confused um, if our information, you know, that we're getting through the news feed in terms of saying now people 65 and over um, can get the vaccine. Um, how is that um, just to if you can clear that up a little bit compared to what like the, uh, the yeah. grid that you just showed us from Massachusetts. So that's the CDC recommendations for it. And I think what we all have to remember is there's different information for different steps, right? So the federal information that's coming out is different than many of the 
the state recommendations for the rollout. And right now, Massachusetts is a little different with the rollout. Um, so people should really be focusing on the messaging from the mass.gov site for the clear information and how it's going to impact us as Massachusetts residents. Um, but I know that the Department of Public Health is evaluating the information that comes out from the CDC regularly and Health and Human Services. So I think more to come with that chapter. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah. Um, um, I want to, uh, I'm aware, I see, um, I see Mila's hand and I'm also aware that uh, Jacqueline had some, uh, uh, some concerns um, about uh, uh, sanitizing uh, surfaces in public transportation. Why don't we just go to that? Uh, Jacqueline, do you, uh, can, could you speak briefly to that? Yes, yes, and it will be brief uh, because I'm still working at pulling together the resolution. Um, I use the PVTA van services. And for the most part, I would say, I would start out by saying that um, the drivers wear masks uh, for protection and they have the signs up. So to that extent, they are observing what I would uh, assume to be some of the standards for CDC COVID sanitizing. However, uh, a couple of weeks ago, I questioned, um, especially after I was on the van with, I joined uh, the van with somebody else and um, there, it was not possible for us to be six feet apart. And yet I, you know, I, I, was just biding my time until I, I was dropped off at my place. But while, while riding, I asked the driver, how often do they sanitize the van? And between, whether it's between passengers, and he indicated that they sanitize every day at the end of the day. And I, it, it made me a little bit concerned uh, because I have a number of people in my, um, in my family circle and extended family circle in other parts of the country who have contracted COVID and have not been as fortunate as some in some other circles to survive it. And uh, he said they do, they use some kind of cleaning solution that is so strong that it would be hard for the people to, to um, endure it. And I, I, that still made me concerned because between, between passengers, I think that there should be something that could at least give us an illusion of, of something being sanitized. Um, and so it, it means while the service is overall good, I think there are some concerns that need to be addressed. And if there is some way for them to be able to sanitize between passengers, especially. Emma, do you want to speak to that? And I'm afraid, I, I regret that that's going to have to be our last question. Um. Yeah, I, I know that the PVTA and other private agencies are, are doing really fairly well at sanitizing and cleaning. I think one of the challenges, like you said, Jacqueline, is that the, the products that are approved to uh, clean against COVID uh, infections and viruses are very strong chemicals and do have a lot of off-gassing and can be pretty caustic. Um, so that's one of the challenges. I th one of the recommendations that I would say to do is, is make sure that it, even if we can't make sure that the, the bus is 100% clean, because I don't know if that's realistic because of the cleaning materials, even though I know that all of us would love to have that in gold standard. Certainly I can reach out to the PVTA and try and hear their practices a little bit better, um, but would be to have your own hand sanitizer on you and really make sure that you are being keeping good hand hygiene um, with anything that you're touching if you are on the PVT one or another bus. Thank you so much, Emma, for your work and your um, making room uh, um, for us and your uh, welcome at any yeah. time. No, thank okay. you so much for having me. 
All right, thank you. You're welcome. And, and, Emma, can I just ask one thing before you go, is that you could just make mention of the COVID testing site uh, that's been established at UMass, because I, I have had a lot of seniors ask about- Oh my uh, gosh, yeah that they should be accessing and how frequently because the, the vaccine and the COVID testing go together as a network of safety. That is a great point, Mary Beth. And I'm so sorry that I forgot to mention that. I'm just so thinking about our clinic downstairs. So UMass has a terrific asymptomatic testing site at the Mullen Center. You can just sign up online. You have to make an appointment before and it takes about five minutes to go through. Uh, it's very well operated, um, but very great social distancing. You swab your own nose so no one else has to do it for you. And it's really just in the tip of your nostril. And then you put your sample in the tube and you give it to them. And then they email you the results within about 24 hours. And if you were to get a positive result, they would call you. Um, but other than that, you would get an email and it's a great service. It's right next door at UMass at the Mullen Center. Um, and, and they still have availability. I know that they've had availability, I think every day, Mary Beth, don't you think? Yeah, That's yeah, pretty I much. I was just on the site again yesterday. Yeah. Yeah. And, and they, you can sign up to get it every once a week for the community members. Um, and we do encourage that. So, because they do say that about 50% of people that become um, infected with COVID can be asymptomatic. So it's always good to get that test just for that reassurance, I think, too. Okay, thanks so much. Great. All right. Everybody stay safe and healthy, okay? Okay. Thanks. Bye. Emma. And I'd like to just add that we have a number of seniors who have called me about the COVID testing and they obviously don't have the ability to go online or to make the appointment. Mm. And so we here at the Senior Center are able to link people up um, and I, I've made appointments for individuals. Um, they've been able to have some email. So those who don't have email, that becomes a little bit more problematic um, that the email and the return come, would come to our email. And then they'd have to come in and receive that email because it's HIPAA protected information. So I, I just letting people know that if you're having trouble and if you are a senior and you need to make that appointment and you need assistance, I'm, I've walked through this with a number of individuals and, and they've all said it's been great. I had a 94 year old yesterday who said this was so smooth and easy and it was great, Mary Beth. So please do let people know that we can help them to access that. That's excellent, thank you. Bye-bye, okay. So, um, okay, can so I just on- pack, yeah, Can I just, Mindy Dom did, um, indicate that that she wasn't able to speak earlier so mm -hmm. i think she is here on the on the call and she switched out the technology and she just wanted to to sort of make a few remarks and i just wanted to acknowledge her attendance so she texted sure. me we welcome her to speak go ahead mindy good morning everybody can you hear me okay yes good oh i'm so glad my um i had to switch technology as mary beth said because for some reason my microphone wasn't working on my other one. First of all, I'm so glad to be here and to listen and to learn. And what I learn when I come to these meetings is where I can be a great advocate for. I mean, not that I am a great advocate, but where I can really deliver advocacy. And so um, already I have a list going that I'm gonna check in with Mary Beth afterwards. I know that the PVTA bought um, a very special piece of equipment that was very expensive around um, sanitizing its vehicles at the beginning of the pandemic but I'm gonna check in with them and just see what they do in between trips. I'm also gonna check in with how they um, achieve six feet distance in the vans, because I think that is sort of an interesting um, question to see how they're grappling with that, particularly since we know that the populations that take the vans are probably the more vulnerable populations for infection. Mm -hmm. um, and I also, I'm thrilled that uh, Emma was here to talk about vaccination. I can't stress enough that the um, state is updating these prioritized populations um, pretty frequently, not only based on their recognition of, oops, we forgot this, or advocacy from some groups, but based on the CDC's recommendations. So it's quite possible, Mary Beth, that we might see um, mm -hmm. the state website change today, because it's Thursday, to include the 65 and older. Um, especially because we're taking our lead on 
who should get vaccinated from the CDC, although the state is in control of the prioritization of that and what the populations are. I will, I mean, Emma maybe can't say this and maybe I shouldn't say this, but um, in terms of the, in response to the supply question, it's really a fault of this administration that we don't have a regular, consistent, adequate supply of the vaccine. There's already been information that, you know, the Trump administration refused to order an additional um, millions of doses when they had an opportunity. I don't want to blame the companies on this. I think the companies actually were sort of begging the administration to put in their orders so they could put vaccine aside for the United States, but they weren't getting those orders. But hopefully that changes this coming Wednesday. And I am really hopeful that with the new administration, there will be, and who's already said, we're, our priority is to get as much vaccine out there as possible, that they will invoke the National Defense Production Act and other um, levers that they have at their disposal to get the manufactured and the supply up. But I also want to remind folks that in order to really do this mass vaccination, supply is part of it. And supply also doesn't only include vaccines, it also includes syringes, and it also includes vaccinators. We need a workforce and we need settings. So there's a whole logistic piece that I also am hopeful that a new administration is going to be much more involved in, much more engaged with, and um, be able to really uh, sort of roll out in a very planned, coordinated, effective way. So I hate to say, let's wait till Wednesday, but I think a shift in administration will shift the federal commitment around vaccine in a different way that will be helpful to the state. I also want to say that if people think that they represent or they know people who represent a particular population that's not prioritized that they think should be, there's an email address on that website that people should write to. They can also you know, let my office know. We're forwarding those questions to the state. Um, but I do think there's a little bit of, we got to wait online. <laughs> Hopefully seniors are not going to wait longer than anybody, you know, that are going to be in the front of the line. But for most people in the state who are not over the age of 75 at this point, I think it's, we're going to have to wait. But thankfully, we're not waiting without any um, prevention available. We have masks, we have social distancing, we have a whole lot of steps that we can take avoiding large crowds. Um, that are available to us. So we're not completely vulnerable. And I really wanna stress that, that prevention is actually here to bridge the gap to vaccination. Um, I love that Mary Beth, you brought up the UMass site. That site is continuing four days a week until January 21st, and then it will be reduced, but still available. So it's not being eliminated just because students are coming back. There'll still be community testing. The by appointment part of that site is really important because it not only allows them to know how many people to expect, but more importantly, it keeps the crowds down. So it keeps the potential for infection low. Um, and that's going to be really critical, especially as that site opens up to do more things, whether it's campus testing and vaccination. Um, UMass this week, I believe, that site is also being enlisted to do first responder um, vaccination for the region. And uh, many of us in the legislature hope that once first responders are vaccinated, that that site will continue to be a regional vaccination site for other populations. That hasn't been determined yet, but we're hoping that why start new when you've got something else going. Um, so thank you so much. I don't wanna, I could actually talk for the whole morning and I'm not gonna. <laughs> Um, but I just want to make sure that people know that if you have any uh, questions about uh, what the state's doing, what they're not doing, please feel free to reach out. Advocacy for state agencies. Um, my office is working remotely, but we are still working. Um, and so if things come up and they involve a state funded program or service like the PVTA, that you'll feel comfortable reaching out. And I just want to really shout out all of your efforts and Mary Beth in particular for being a real local hero in terms of trying to figure out how to deliver services to a vulnerable population when all of our usual ways of delivering services are not um, following public health guidelines. So I, I thank all of you for your volunteer efforts on this and Mary Beth, I am an admirer and a fan. And um, 
I want to give you the local medal of honor. There we go. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, well, I, I, I don't, I don't, I, I hope that I don't have to wear it or bear it. Um, but, but one thing I will, I will tell you the only, the, the piece of information that I just, we share with uh, our regional councils on aging, we share with Mass Council on aging, as well as the Executive Office of Elder Affairs that we've been talking about the vaccination process for seniors is that any process that becomes reliant on technology to sign up will fail with our population. And mm -hmm. I think that we've seen that during the pandemic that the number of people who can access technology so limits and would create an inequitable access system. So mm -hmm. that's just a piece, you know, we, we all echo that. Um, yeah. You know, so I know that we've been able to cobble together appointments for COVID testing for those who want to, but many people I know we, we don't catch because they don't have access to technology. They don't know how to use it. It's just, they, or they'll tell me like, that's just too overwhelming. I don't, I'd like to buy and I don't want to bother with it. So those uh, other forms that other states are looking at around, well, like whether you take parts of the alphabet and say seniors who are A and B come on these days um, and, and allow more open drive-ins kinds of situation uh, are going to be important to that, as well as our ability to work with populations that don't speak English. So it's just like, you know, the work that you you lay the seeds for with the census, Mindy. Um, mm -hmm. It's going to be outreach and it's going to be people talking to people because the number one concern and literally I get hundreds of calls like you know, the past couple of days. It's been uh, um, really uh, I just I don't I don't know the word it's because it's not overwhelming. It's it's appropriate response that um, individuals, the number one concern is that there will be a vaccination going on and they won't know it. Mm. That's the concern they want. How will I know when you're doing it? That's, mm -hmm. you know, because pe people tell me, or I have adult children calling me saying, how will I know? My mother's 94, I live in New Hampshire, she's here, she doesn't watch TV, she doesn't, you know, the forms of media that you or I might visit, she doesn't. So it's I'm gonna be uh, an interesting. I'll reach out. So I just want, that's the only piece of advocacy that, that I would like to share. Well, I think in my following up on that, because what I what I will do today is I will follow up in two different directions on that. One is with the Secretary of Health and Human Services, who's taking on this commander role. And the other is with my colleague, Ruth Balzo, who's the chair of the Elder Services Committee, or at least was up until January 5th. And I think probably still acting that way while our committees get um, trained out. Can you give me a sense of what are the alternatives for people who don't rely on the traditional sources of media to find out? Like, what do you rec What would your recommendation for your population in Amherst be? Would you want to make sure that you had people who could go knock on doors, phone yeah. call? How are we? Yeah, we, we, some of the, some of them. I know that we're going to have to knock on doors. I have people who still just write me letters. They don't, they don't have a phone, they don't want a phone. They don't read the newspaper. So some of this is going to be, you know, we, we have databases, we have robocalls, but you know, we're gonna to have to use our flyers. We're, we're gonna to have to use multiple levels of communicating to reach seniors. Um, so yeah. what, you know, um, I, what I'm thinking is um, not necessarily here today, but maybe you and I could also meet with other interested people and we could figure out how I could build not just what I can make sure happens on the state end, but how we can mobilize locally. I, yeah. I, you know, I, see, a I see a question from Tim and um, um, and I just wanna also just add to that language communities. It's not clear to me how mm -hmm. people who, who, um, who don't speak English uh, uh, also learn about uh, these things. So that's just another concern. Tim, go ahead. Uh, quick question. Does the state have an opinion or a policy regarding uh, second doses versus uh, dosing, uh, vaccinating everyone first? At this point, um, they haven't said that they do. You know, I think that's going to probably be something that they're going to recommend in the next, I'd say, two weeks. Um, and I say that because of the potential for this other strain of the virus being coming down the pike and wanting to make sure that as many people get vaccinated as possible before we start to see that, um, or until we start to realize that that virus, that strain is in the Commonwealth. So they haven't yet said um, first, everybody gets first doses first, but we're hearing that from the incoming administration. We're hearing that from 
other public health people. So I think it's just a matter of time before they say, we're going to use whatever supply we have. I also think that they probably are reluctant to say that until they know there's going to be that second dose. And I don't know if they know that's that supply of the second dose is, I think that's what we're waiting for a new administration to say is that go for it because we're going to employ all these other le um, measures to make sure that we have an adequate second dose in three to four weeks. Thank you. Um, mm -hmm. So I think right now it's just, you know, three weeks for the Moderna and four weeks for Pfizer and keeping with that, that track. Thank you for that question. Thank you. Good. Okay, folks, moving on um, question. to Mary Beth, I wanted to make sure that you, um, if there are any other, other updates um, and kind of uh, morphing into, uh, and I think one of the uh, updates is, has to do with uh, a walkability. Um, but yes. before we get into that, if there if there are anything you anything else you wanted to add about to your update besides what we've discussed, yeah, no, I, I guess I, it is that uh, we are doing that. We're in the planning stages for launching our age friendly, dementia friendly effort, which the town will be proceeding with. We'll be performing a working group, and then I'll be working with the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission in July uh, through a grant, and we will be conducting a large-scale survey of all of Amherst seniors and getting a better sense of what the needs are, the priorities, uh, those two labels. I'll be, I'll be bringing some more information for you about what the age-friendly and dementia-friendly labels mean and what they translate to. But basically, if you think of it as the social determinants of health, so everything from transportation to the hardscape environment, to healthcare, to education and culture, looking at what we have here in town, both mapping our resources that we presently have, and then putting forward a plan of how we're going to continue to make it accessible and friendly to individuals who are aging, and also those who might be experiencing dementia. And of course, uh, the, the statistics on dementia are rising. They are anticipating upwards to a 30 to 40% increase due to the isolation um, due to COVID. And certainly we're seeing that anecdotally uh, amongst our individuals who have sheltered and been vulnerable and unable to leave their homes that uh, even the progression is much greater and more rapid. So we have a lot of work ahead of us and I will be bringing information at the next meeting with a presentation on age friendly, dementia friendly, and then the walkability piece Pat will introduce, but I have some really great news uh, around proceeding for a grant uh, that Karen, Pat, and I, I believe, uh, for the yeah. of us um, participated in. Uh, Pat, do you mind if I yes, go ahead. make a, a quick, uh, just going backwards for a second. Um, Mindy, I put out to, um, to Emma Dragon um, just about the possibility, I probably should have CC'd Paul Bockelman on it, but as an Amherst uh, resident, um, I was really, I was encouraging, I think at this time, it would be great if maybe if a robocall was sent out again, just to help to lower the anxiety to say, we got this, just sit tight. This is the plan. This is the website you can go to, but just know that we're, you're not going to miss it, you know, and, and it's not only for seniors, right, but for all residents. And I think it would go a long way to send out another robocall because I know it really helped when they did that with the COVID testing. So um, I didn't want to inundate Paul with, you know, with more emails and stuff. Like I said, I did mention to Emma, but I know she's also really busy, but I thought it would go a long way. I think that's a great idea because I think that um, at least giving people the website address that they can go and see what the priority is and that, um, you know, they'll, that there'll be more information coming. I also think I was just going to write to Mary Beth that I would like to know where I can direct seniors to connect to a database that then they, uh, that you may be thinking that you're gonna tap into mm -hmm. to use for that senior outreach. And it may be an appropriate thing in the robocall to say, if you know a senior who's concerned, please make sure that they are part of the senior outreach or whatever at, and then give information. Because I think the more that we can sort of um, almost like push people to information portals that we know will have mm -hmm. the information now the better prepared we'll be when the when the supply comes and when the prioritization gets qualified. So I'm I'm like in the middle of writing an email to Mary Beth saying let's get together. But I mm -hmm. also want to know what where I should tell people to go. Like if you're using a particular database to do outreach or that you anticipate using outreach for, 
I want to make sure that people know that now's the time to sign up for that database. Right. Um, and, you know, that's a good thing if we're able to do that. We get people's current addresses, phone numbers, however they like to be contacted. And mm -hmm. we can, we'll always be able to get volunteers in Amherst to be able to do the outreach one way or the other. I am not, uh, I am not concerned about that. I think once people need to be notified, people are just wanting to help their neighbors. They're, they're, they're sitting on their, you know, my mother had this expression of sitting on their spokes. I'm not really sure, like they're eager um, to help. And I think that uh, doing some of that outreach may be one way to connect them to be able to help with their neighbors. But if we're able to sort of generate this information that here's what you can do now to be prepared to get the information later, I think that's very reassuring. I agree, Karen. Okay. I'll I'll re I'll echo that that question. I think before they use the robocall to advertise the free testing site for symptomatic individuals, they might have been reluctant to say yes to that. But since they've used it for that purpose, they may be open to it. <laughs> right. Thank you. Thank you so much um, yeah. for the, for your uh, ideas and. Um, uh, energy around that those issues. Um, uh, Karen and Mary Beth and I um, have been looking at. Uh, we at actually attended a web webinar um, on uh, resources available through the Commonwealth um, on um, walkability. Uh, it's part of the uh, transportation uh, Department of Transportation initiative, and. Um, as a result of that, first of all, it was uh, a highly informative and energizing workshop. And it got us thinking about all our friends uh, and neighbors um, who love walking for health, for uh, um, both mental and physical, um, for connection with nature, the whole gamut of things. Um, that affect and also enrich our community because uh, walkers are quite a, 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 a very diverse group and um, and they when when seniors pause sometimes uh, groups of walkers will pause and uh, uh, gather and chat at a, a local coffee shop and so it's just also great for local businesses as well. Yeah. So one of the things that we're doing in support of this is to try to elevate the presence of seniors and the importance of seniors related to both um, age-friendly and dementia-friendly uh, opportunities and brainstorming around what would um, uh, improve uh, 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 the uh, the qual the richness of our town and uh, the health of our fellow citizens and ourselves. So we are um, we're at the very earliest stages, I think, of gathering individuals um, who who have an interest, who are who who imp who have a passion for walking, who walk regularly, who bring others into it, and 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 who are excited about. Um, thinking about how we could make that experience more vibrant and advise um, Mary Beth um, and town grant makers for uh, looking for resources uh, to improve that uh, uh, situation for uh, seniors. And so, um, so we're we're on a path for that, and um, uh, I guess what I'm inviting um, I'm inviting fellow council members to help us in that process of identifying walkers in your community uh, or in in your your network of uh, people in town, and um, uh, so that we um, you know can can communicate updates and we'll probably organize we're we haven't discussed this yet but probably organize some sort of um, information session or uh, uh, let's say uh, brainstorming session on what what sites would work what what um, what what better signage could do um, um, I will also <clears throat> say that, we have a resource available that I wanted to share with the council members. And that is that 
um, a woman from um, a, um, who works with the Department of Transportation and also has been involved in many walking projects um, um, in Boston. Um, she chairs Walk Boston and she and other people from this program are, are willing to do workshops to let us know what uh, how other towns have acquired money for uh, uh, to support projects of better signage, of better of, of safer access routes to walking paths. Uh, it, it, um, it, there's just a huge spectrum of um, possible projects, and so why should uh, Karen and Mary Beth and I have all the fun? Uh, my hope was, and and I'm, my interest is that um, what I what I'm interested in hearing from the rest of you about is, would you be open to or interested in having us uh, listen to um, um, a representative from Walk Boston who is so knowledgeable about what's been done in other communities? Any thoughts about that? Or do you want to have anything to add, uh, Karen or Mary Beth? Um, I, I just would, would like to add that one um, exercise in walking in particular is incredibly important to the senior population. What we know from research is that movement and exercise is the number one way to uh, fend off any kind of dementia. And never mind the other ways in which exercise improves overall health and mental health. So that's why movement is very important and critical to what we do in our own mission. Uh, secondly, I have been in touch with our town planner about there, there is one specific grant that is available at this point in time that Pat is referencing the shared streets. We had a number of projects here at the Bank Center that uh, we wanted to accomplish that were exterior and uh, related to um, well-worn pathways that seniors frequently take to access services in downtown that needed improvement. So I... Um, probably almost a year ago, I'd gotten some bids and, and just priced those up so that I'd be able to present more knowingly on those. And I'm gonna be meeting today at one o'clock with one of the assistant town planners to do a walk around the bangs and in our immediate area around walking trails and loops and seeing what um, is happening and, and sort of getting their opinion on some of that. But there's a lot more work to be done, you know, including the, the walkability study. And I know Rosemary is nodding her head because she has been involved in this from the get go. She's an avid walker. Um, and, and so many of you, right, you know, when we were doing our move and groove, um, walking is, is important, whether you're walking to golf, Tim, or whether you're walking, um, you know, out on a trail like Rosemary does. So, and I know Sue goes out on the, the path there by green leaves because we, I recently gotten a call about a bridge that had been damaged. And so we sent the inspectors out there. So uh, it's, it is a, a very broad uh, issue and um, we're hoping to bring in some more resources and some experts uh, from the state who provide technical assistance for free and some pro bono assistance. Um, and, and that will also fold in with our age friendly and dementia friendly campaign and effort around accessibility. Um, so it doesn't have to be limited to the downtown. And then Pat also, I just wanna mention uh, had a, a, a a colleague and uh, she, she and her husband have actually mapped out a number of walking routes um, and graded them by difficulty and terrain um, and has done a tremendous amount of work. And so I'm gonna be working with her to create some online materials uh, using what she's created. And then also uh, having it put into like a booklet form that seniors would have and available and, and it will include some maps and trails. And we're gonna be working with some students on that project to to buttress what she's got. And we're very excited about that. So move and groove, keep walking and yeah. There has been such enthusiasm. I mean, uh, I've just reached out in my own little uh, area network of people uh, at Greenleaves and my gosh, the enthusiasm just blows my hair back. Uh, there's just such a, uh, such a, a great uh, interest in this. So. My sense is that uh, we can really um, make some uh, progress in this area uh, for this first round of funding and possibly more. But the, the key I think is organizing and uh, identifying folks who are uh, uh, passionate about this topic uh, that'll help us 
in this issue and other issues of importance to seniors in the future. So um, the name of the woman from Walk Boston is Leanne Taylor. And uh, mm -hmm. uh, I was looking through my notes uh, about that. And uh, so um, anyway, uh, there'll be more on that as we move along. Um, I'm looking at our time and I'm looking at our uh, ambitious agenda. And I'm, I'm saying, I'm thinking that um, we will probably, uh, there's a few items that we'll probably table for next time. They're not so time sensitive as some of these other uh, projects. Um, so uh, let's Pat, see. I, so, Pat, I have a, a comment to make that may be time sensitive. As far as the robocalls are concerned, I think it's important that a lot of attention be paid to the robocalls being spoken slowly and clearly especially web addresses for everyone, let alone seniors <laughs> that, that mm -hmm. have to, uh, It seems like everyone younger than us speaks 100 miles an hour today. E even people that have some years on them are, are speaking faster than I can comprehend much of the time. So we need to make sure that those robocalls are slow and clear when it comes to a, a website. <laughs> yes. That's an excellent point, and uh, yeah, because otherwise, you if you it it, it becomes a, a source of frustration, and it's important information. People are taking the time to reach out to you, and you've got your pencil in your bathroom, so <laughs> you, you might not get the information that you need um, in order to. Uh, and be aware of it. So we don't want it to be another source of frustration for seniors, that's for sure. We don't need any more. Thank you. Okay, I see Ch uh, Ch uh, Chad's hand up. Yes. Um, all uh, I'm, I'm looking, um, can you unmute? unmute? Also, also that some of us don't have phones. You're talking right. about robocalls. Sure, gotta absolutely. Go Got to go by email as well. Right. I think that it's clear that a variety of methods are going to have to be used. And uh, so I would echo what Mindy said about, uh, you know, neighbors looking out for neighbors and identifying others who uh, need information, particularly, um, and reassurance, reassurance as well. Um, yeah, uh, and I have to think that those uh, uh, systemically hard to reach populations, um, you know, um, again and again get overlooked um, in uh, uh, these, you know, in in these um, in get being being able to receive information that will help protect. Uh, health and well-being. So uh, there's no doubt about that. We need to figure out strategies for overcoming obstacles. Uh, yes. So, um, and I'm hearing some good suggestions from all of you. Um, I'd like to turn next to um, um, the updates on our committee structure. And um, let me just, uh, I sent you some documents uh, even today. Um, and let me just tell you what my process, uh, our process has been um, on, on this and where we stand. Um, um, just as a reminder um, that we, um, we realized that having five committees on a, uh, of, um, in, a, in a group of nine people uh, was perhaps um, um, not um, terribly um, realistic. And so um, really I would like to recognize the great help that um, one of our most seasoned members, uh, Rosemary Koffler has had together. She and I have been noodling together over how we could uh, be leaner and meaner or maybe leaner and kinder uh, in figuring out how to um, uh, uh, 
eliminate the five committee structure and replace it with three, um, but also to delineate uh, something about the charges of uh, the, uh, these committees to give them some uh, uh, direction and some tasks uh, to consider. Um, she, she made an, uh, an important point with uh, and I, that I agree with that, um, that, that as action groups uh, work with uh, problems that uh, they're always, that, that they're prioritizing. And these are, um, you know, these, these times right now uh, um, are uh, an example of, of the need to, to be able to be nibble, nimble and pivot uh, and sometimes triage to the, the most act, important activities. So I guess I'm, I'm thinking that, um, and so um, anyway, um, the, um, so I worked, I tried to integrate her thinking about this and my own thinking about um, this and come up with um, identifying and naming more simply uh, three committees um, and coming up with a charge for those committees. Um, I, I think my, my sense is, and I, I'd love to hear more feedback from you, is that the committee charges themselves, I think, you know, maybe that, that's useful as, as a working, uh, 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 it's, I guess, let, let me back up and say that I think that the committee charges are like, are inherently fluid. Um, are going likely to be fluid. They can represent some, they, uh, the list that I have put are some of those uh, activities that come to mind in this present moment and perhaps for the year ahead. ahead. Um, but I'm not, I'm, I'm, I have a sense that th that might change over time. So that might uh, figure, that might uh, help us shape uh, where, where it is we're going. Um, so I'm looking, um, I, I, and sort of looking at the, this working document, I wanna just call your attention to a couple of things and then we can open up for, for more discussion. Um, so there are three core items that I've included. One eliminates the five committee structure and replaces it with three of, of committees, well-being, program and services and community culture. Um, the second item is um, encourages every council member to participate in at least one committee. And that really reflects my understanding um, and the, of the past of the way the council has worked um, so that um, uh, the expectation is that each one of you would serve, uh, identify a committee that calls to you uh, that you have some energy around. And, um, and I guess uh, what that, you know, <laughs> what that might mean is that you participate in some way. That does not mean you need to, ch to chair it. In fact, it's probably a good idea to bring in uh, other, you know, other leaders because part of, I think, what we're trying to do is democratize um, um, and enliven uh, the participation of fellow seniors, to diversify the participation of fellow seniors. And so um, it just, I think the presence of council members though on the committee does help any committee keep its focus, at least uh, that is consistent with the mission uh, of the senior center of senior services and what are, and also serves for the committee as a source of information that's reliable and factual and, and helps people stay grounded. Um, so um, you, we may all want to discuss that further, but I wanna ask, I'm sort of bluntly asking each of you, if you think that that's something, uh, if that's a reasonable, uh, a requirement and or expectation of your time and talent um, in, in service of uh, that purpose. And uh, finally, um, yeah, uh, the, the committees, um, 
uh, should be populated and, uh, uh, with individuals committed to becoming involved in some way in helping the committee. So they could be part of a working group, they could be part of a policy group, they could be individuals uh, like, uh, who have a special expertise uh, to offer the senior center. So part of what Mary Beth and I constantly talk about is how we can mobilize uh, different people with different kinds of talents and expertise and experience in support of um, the important uh, activities and programs and services of the, of the council itself um, and, and, the se and senior services generally. So um, yeah, and a component of that would also that we've been discussing is um, make perhaps and when we're perhaps making uh, a little more of uh, the of um, I don't know uh, respecting and maybe elevating uh, uh, people as um, associate members associate members of the senior center uh, are kind of like super volunteers they're doing the work that keeps us going um, uh, the our council does work that keeps the senior services going and responsive to the communities in which we live. Um, but we cannot do our work alone, obviously. Um, and so uh, having an associate membership, they wouldn't, associate members of, like anyone, of course, could attend our meeting and, and we might well invite them, uh, but they, they're not appointed in the same way that uh, each of us has been appointed. Um, so that's the overall plan. And I, I guess maybe that's the best place to start um, in reviewing this, this working document. Um, any any um, thoughts on any of this? That, that, uh, Mila, I, yeah. I see you. Can you, <clears throat> excuse me, can you tell us again the five major committees you have, and then you said you want to reduce that to three? Um, yes. Um, I mean, I'm saying yes too quickly because I, um, I don't have, it. let me see, let me just see if I can pull out the original text on that. Um, we had a committee on, um, hold on here. Trying to think of excuse me, I, but I do have it at my fingertips. Oh, thank you. That's okay. excellent. Thank you, okay. Rosemary. The standing committees in the original bylaws had been transportation, okay, funding, wellness, Highland Valley Elder Services, and the nominating committee. And we had determined that the nominating committee is really not, shouldn't be a standing committee anyway. It's an ad hoc committee, right. Right. which is appointed only at a yes. certain period of time for one month. Yes. Okay. Uh, the funding committee is, I think we determined that also should be not a part of the council since we are not, well, I won't get into that. Maybe Tim can talk about that more carefully. <laughs> <laughs> what do you say, Tim? <laughs> Unmute. There. <clears throat> I agree. <laughs> okay. No, All right. Because, yeah, it, it's more appropriate for the friends and others to do the fundraising than us as appointed members uh, of the town. So without getting into all that detail, I agree with that. And Highland Valley Elder Services is also... Um, we have a representative there uh, to Highland Valley. In fact, Pat has graciously volunteered to do that. Um, and uh, that is not really a committee per se. Yeah. So um, transportation perhaps and wellness are both. And those would be included in the document that we establish for well-being programs and services and community yeah. culture. Mm -hmm. the three committees to replace mm -hmm. what we have now. 
that doesn't uh, the yes. reduction to three committees does not reduce in any no, way. No, it doesn't no. reduce the workload. I'll tell you that. Right. And I, I see Jacqueline's hand up. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. I I think I think this is this is a good breakdown, and that maybe the idea of having Jacqueline, excuse me, we're having trouble hearing you. Can you? Uh, I don't know. Do something. Let me see. Hello. You're Can actually, you hear me? You're asking yes. from two two different yes. times. And we're okay. Getting, we're getting feedback. Okay. Is this better? Yes. Yes. Um, I think this is a good idea, and perhaps we can we can look at having subcommittees or work groups, as you suggested, and mm -hmm. that because you've gotten the 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 basics of what we are looking to be doing. One is look at well-being programs and services and brought in the community. So having subcommittees within the co committees. Mm -hmm. um, the term, I, I, I would agree. I think, I guess one of the things that I'm, I'm learning uh, humbly is that the uh, language matters, <laughs> um, that, that a working group, for example, uh, does not have the requirement to uh, to establish uh, um, to to to, uh, um, to hold public meetings to you know because they're still working on problem solving uh, they're not making a policy recommendations they're they're right. just they're gathering information and so forth so the the let's just say the paperwork and the complexity in that regard has is reduced it gives uh, people an opportunity to kind of work through an issue together uh, with uh, less sort of inc I don't want to call it encumberment that's not quite fair but um, they can they can spend more of their time and energy less on the mechanics of meeting to of, of meeting together and setting up public meetings and recording and minutes and and all those things things and, and spend more time focusing on some problem solving. So w working group is something, uh, and Mary Beth could speak to that more. Um, subcommittees, I think, do have obligations to, um, to, to hold public meetings. They act as, um, you know, pu the uh, public bodies and, and thus are required to, uh, uh, to um, um, have, uh, post their agenda in advance, uh, you know, 48 hours before. Um, so um, th that's, that distinction is important. Okay. And I think, I think um, um, and I'm just expressing myself here on this one, that we need to be able to have um, uh, those uh, uh, energi energized people work, who are, want to do some really, pr some practical work together. Uh, to be able not to be encumbered and uh, not to be to be able to focus on that work and, and to make progress on that. So that's uh, I hope that's a help. Those distinctions are helpful. Yes, yes, and 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 I think having laid out the charges in conjunction with that makes it even more helpful um, because in the course of working on committees one can begin or ones people can begin to see some of the issues that are emerging. And while they have a broad charge, they can adapt some particular activities to uh, specific needs. Mm -hmm. Okay, any other comments from uh, uh, Tim? Um. Oh, okay, I'm unmuted. Thank you. Uh, yeah, for, I, I, I like these committees uh, and the document a little better than the first time. My, as you recall from the last meeting, uh, when one establishes committees and structures like this, I think we need to be short, we need to be clear, and we need to be direct so people understand immediately what we're talking about. 
Mm -hmm. uh, that entails the titles, the charges, and so forth. And I think this is a much better um, summation of that, and I appreciate the, the edits. Um, so I have a couple of editorial comments about the document itself, which sure. is uh, well, I think the first one, well-being, I think it's well-written. My on the charge on all of them, they start, this is a minor point, but they start to explore ways. I don't think you need the word to, you can just start with explore ways of, and then the charge with a second advise and so on, and eliminate the two. That's just a minor point as an editorial, as an editorial comment. Um, now, more substantively, uh, program and services, we mentioned in an earlier discussion today, the word accessibility. I think that's really important. And in a way, that's what the program and services does. So I would, on the first bullet point, we say uh, review, study, and make recommendations as to for safe, reliable transportation. And I would just add an accessibility uh, just as a suggestion. So we have it in there so people know that's where uh, one addresses accessibility questions. Uh, Absolutely. And accessibility questions, I would echo that, um, would, would uh, go to really all, uh, all our programs. Yeah. 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 I know. Yeah. Uh, so that would be one suggestion. <laughs> and then the third one, I just don't understand immediately what community culture means. So I would suggest changing that title and I would change it to, this is a suggestion for me, to inclusiveness and culture. And that sort of broadens what this whole topic talks about. Community culture by itself, standing alone, I just don't understand, myself, I don't understand that. And one suggestion would be to just to have inclusiveness and culture, something like that, that more pinpoints exactly what this committee is supposed to be doing. Then all the bullet points in the charge, uh, relates to that. So that's just one suggestion. Um, and then the third, the third uh, or related to that, I don't understand the charge. I don't think, I don't understand words like achieve a wider wisdom in communities. I just don't think people, I don't know what that means. Um, so I would, uh, I just don't feel comfortable with the wording in, in that charge. I actually like Rosemary's draft better. Uh, the one that says that her charge was older adults and so on and so forth, if you had that uh, in front of you. So that would be one comment. Um, so those are, I have a couple others, but I don't want to dominate here uh, uh, some of the specifics, but those are, let me start by starting there. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, let's see. I see. Um, Rosemary's hand, and I see uh, Jacqueline's hand, and I see Yvette's hand. So uh, let's see, we've heard, uh, let's, Yvette, we haven't heard from you yet, so why don't we, why don't you speak up? And I see Ch uh, Chad's hand too. Okay, thank Great. you. All right. Uh, as I was reviewing uh, your document, um, I was struck that, well, I was um, attracted to the second and third parts, right? How to include, involve community, the seniors. And then I was struck that, uh, that um, if I was doing that, I'm sure, I'm not sure, but I would imagine others would also be drawing to particular um, subcommittees. And, and I also then thought, well, this is an opportunity for service. It looks like it's civic service. And I think it's important that maybe as subcommittee uh, members that we learn something um, that we didn't work on before perhaps, because it's sort of like preaching to the choir, you know? So that's all I want to say, that it would be good to challenge ourselves, maybe by joining a subcommittee that um, is um, it's, uh, not something that you would be drawn to to begin with. So civic duty and learning something, challenging ourselves. Okay. 
Okay, I'm getting feedback. Okay, all right. Um, that's, we did, that's all I wanted we did to hear you. Um, thank you, Yvette. Um, let's see, uh, Chad, we haven't heard from you much yet. Why don't you go next? Let me put down my hand first. Um, I'm the odd man out. Um, I kind of, you know, being maybe the new guy, um, I take a totally different approach to it. Um, for me, the charge for this group is the Elder Americans Act of 1964. That's, that's what we're about. We can go about that any way we want, you know, with the constraints of the town being a town, um, a town entity, um, you know, we, as you said, we have to have the 24 hour notice on the meetings and all that. But this discussion is talking about how we go about that. We can go about that any way we want. That's, that's in our power. And for me, committees, we can sit around. I mean, I'm involved in, in another organization that has bifurcated goals. There's a socialization, isolation reduction type thing and a service thing, you know, providing a service we sit around and try to name every service that somebody could need or want. We can never come up with that. We have to ask the people, what do you need? And then, you know, perform that or give them that. And this is the same thing. We can sit around and try to come up with all these ideas, but unless we have a strategic plan, uh, you know, a work plan, I mean, the vision and values never change, but down to the next level, the mission, most organizations rewrite a new mission every five years or so. The mission comes from data. Um, today I learned from uh, Mary Beth that there's gonna be a survey coming out. Uh, maybe that's something that we wanna look at and say, what are the needs of Amherst for the elders? You know, How do we supply that? What is that? Um, and the committees will flow from that. From that data, we begin with the next level, which is what is the mission for the next five years? Then from that comes goals. You know, it just keeps getting down like a, like a, a funnel. What, what are the exact objectives to those goals? Uh, you know, what's the timeline? And even all the way down to tasks and individual, what individuals need. So to me, you know, the committees come from that, uh, that larger plan. Okay, thank, thank you for that. Um, I see Jacqueline. No, she just didn't lower her hand from the last time. Oh, okay, <laughs> all right. Okay, I see Rosemary and Mila. Uh, go ahead, Rosemary. I did have a number of comments about the document um, that you had sent out, Pat, originally. And I'm wondering actually if I'm able to share my screen because I put a number of things in red. Um, let me try that, okay? Sure. Uh, let me see. Let me see if I can do that. Mm, did that work? No, I guess yeah, not. Yeah, I'm seeing something there, yeah. Oh. <laughs> right. Program and service. Uh, that's not the one I wanted to, you know, that might be the one I wanted. Ah, good. Um, for instance, I, there was a number in the first well-being, I think that you had this goal or chart uh, described in this uh, upper sentence. It should be separate, I think. Um, okay. And I thought this statement was very peculiar. Um, by okay. choice or circumstance, those who are not lonely, but happily so, I, I don't think that's necessary Okay. in that statement. Um, and then coming down here, I, th I, I agree with Tim totally about this charge is, is vague. I don't know what wider wisdom is and, <laughs> um, I think it should, I, I just had trouble with that. I also had trouble with some of these other statements. They're not clear, they're not simple, they're not um, easily understood. And this, um, 
acronym, I don't think we should ever use an acronym in a document. Uh-huh. Sure. Unless it's been carefully identified or. Sure. And I, I didn't, uh, I apologize for that because I didn't, my, I meant, you can see my asterisk, I meant to identify that it stands for Black, Indigenous. Yeah, and I, I put that. Yeah. Right. Okay. Exactly. Uh -huh. I need that, but not yeah. everybody knows that. No, that's right. You're right. Uh -huh. It needs that. Absolutely. Um, yeah, keep going. Yeah. And for instance, this statement to establish ongoing occasions for white identified people to build multicultural competence, respectful practices as allies and witnesses and interrupters of racist systems seems like a really complicated way of saying something that could be more simple. Mm -hmm. I would welcome new language on that. <laughs> sure. And um, yeah, to build self and collective advocacy skills among identity groups and to affirm the contributions that seniors make to the well-functioning of Amherst also seems it, like it needs more definition to me. Sure. Yeah. It's not okay. a simple yeah. statement. It's not, sure. I, I would sit here and say, well, what exactly does that mean if I'm on that? Yeah, sure. yeah, 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 yeah. That's fair. I think those are fair, fair comments. And um, thank you. And thank you for that. I, I think uh, I, uh, I appreciate those, the comments that everyone is making um, uh, as, uh, you know, welcoming, uh, as we're sort of defining what it is, how we want our committees to function. And so mm -hmm. I think those are helpful. And I feel like I've not adequately, I haven't been clear enough myself. Um, and let me, let me uh, explain uh, to everyone uh, what, at least what, what, what I'm proposing or what I'm thinking about it really drawn from what, what I'm uh, learning um, about um, um, the task of um, um, of looking at our current institutions and and definitely not only making them more inclusive, but in the process also uh, helping to support them for, uh, to be less white centric. I guess that's what I'm trying to say here. And that one of the things that happens in our Congress and in other communities is that, that the two things are, are supported. And uh, I'm looking for graceful language to indicate that. On one hand, um, on one hand what, we, what we look for are opportunities for us to, uh, to come together as a full community. But there's also some value in specific identity groups like caucuses the, in Congress. There's a white, there's a black caucus. There is a Latino caucus. There are, that because our, our culture has damaged certain identity and social groups that, that, that um, and because and I'm, I, this is my editorializing, because white people continue to do some damage to people of color in our language, in our, uh, our uh, uh, holding, uh, let's say, holding on to power and not dem and, and to the and old ways of, that have, a, have the impact of adversely and disproportionately impacting people of color, that we need, there is work for white people to do. And I wanted to be bold about stating that, um, but also to recognize, so that's, that's kind of one problem to conceptualize. But I do think that doesn't mean that we, we create uh, new ghettos of different groups. No, it means that we move, that we also create uh, I guess the, the end game, if there is one, is, is that um, we come together, that we want people 
people to be inclusive, but responsibly so, sensitively so, so we don't crash into each other and inadvertently exclude and, uh, and insult and uh, speak ignorantly. Uh, so that's, that's what I, I, I guess what I'm, uh, that's what I'm looking, looking to, to, to do. Um, and um, so I would welcome, um, you know, and I'm also, I'm just looking up at the time now because I promised Angela that we would be, uh, she's got another meeting that she, that, uh, she has to slot into this space. Um, and and um, I, I wanna uh, uh, recognize Sue, she's got her hand up as well. Go ahead, Sue. And unmute, okay, good. Yeah, that's just to say, we. In five minutes, Angela wants us off. Okay, thank you. All right. So um, I would say, I, so here's what I'm, I'm going to ask. Um, this is a, a vitally important conversation and I really want us all together to get this right and to figure it out. So I'm going to ask um, anyone who uh, has, who, who could work with me, uh, email me, call me, <laughs> that sort of thing, so that we can polish the, these things up. Um, do so. Do connect with me, and um, I think Sue would probably like to hear. Um, and then we'll, and th so we'll put the, we'll continue this conversation at our next meeting, and. Um, um, I guess, and the next thing I want to just add, and we'll add other topics that we didn't cover today. Uh, you'll, they'll, those will appear in our next meeting. And um, Sue, uh, would you be looking for uh, a, a, would it be helpful for you to have a, an approval of a motion for approval of minutes? All right. Do I hear uh, Tim? I have some, some changes or additions that I should email to somebody. Okay, it could be, you can either email them to me. Okay. All right, thank you. And Tim, uh, your hand was? Yeah, I was going to just to be formal then, I would uh, move that we adopt the meeting, uh, the minutes subject to the changes in the adaptations from Chad, assuming they aren't substantive. If they are substantive that we have to talk about, then we shouldn't address, but assuming it's just sort of technical things, then I think we could approve the minutes. Okay, do I hear a second? Second. Second. Okay. All right, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Jacqueline? All right, uh, all those opposed? I see no opposition. I uh, do we have a we do we have a quorum supporting the minutes? I think we do. Okay, all right, all right. Uh, topics not regional. Be uh, uh, we'll have to table that uh, that that um, for next meeting. Um, you, um, do I hear a motion for adjournment? So moved. Second. Chad and Tim. Okay. All right. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Thanks, Aye. everyone, for such great thinking and your feedback. It's been really, really helpful. Thank you, Pat. All right. All right. See you all next time. All right. <laughs>